Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 371. That's 371 of the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Apart from sweating my absolute knackers off and drinking some slightly warm temperature water here in my lovely glass i'm feeling pretty well i hope wherever you are you're feeling good too if it's your first time checking the show make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below once you're done and you approve of my message if you're listening via the podcast app please leave me a five star review share the show with your friends download it all that good stuff and if you want to support the show via patreon there's a link in the show notes description of watching via youtube or via pin comment click the patreon link to get access to my entire audio library as well as this show in full hd audio format before it available on any other dsp digital streaming platform in case you're wondering yes i'm smart i know allow it just back off me you can stream it directly via patreon if you back the show for as little as one dollar per month back it on patreon join on there there's a big thriving community of people so make sure you jump on in in there on patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o to get access to my entire library as well as access to this show in full before it's out anywhere else anyway promos out of the way man how's it going um how's it going pretty good i think um i think the world has or the, the, the nation of england has come to a realization that essentially our year is officially done i think i mentioned that in the last show we've been given um a new mandate now with that we're not allowed to meet more than six people outside of our household um clubs are still, still not opened um, which are, they're probably not going to be open for a while. Anything that concerning that concerns large people, large amounts of people gathered in a closed location is not going to happen until there's a vaccine, quite possibly, or until there's a, we've reached some sort of herd immunity, which is a pretty frightening thought, considering um, how um, ill, prepped, or um, unwilling some people were in this country to actually abide by the rules. But I don't blame them. You know, this is one of those weird ones where you kind of have sympathy for both sides. I have sympathy for the, for the government because, you know, even though they're Tories, they probably felt a bit worried that, you know, if they came down with the hammer and installed some sort of draconian rules about, hey, you can't do this, you can't do that, and had, you know, had essentially the SWAT team out there patrolling the streets, people would have, you know, people would have absolutely re revolted. No one would have accepted that. So they kind of had to play it safe and, you know, essentially they played it too safe and they kind of, you know, allowed everyone to interpret the rules as they please. You know, as you would uh, remember what happened with Dominic Cummings, and, you know, one rule for him, one rule for others. And in general, we've kind of now in a situation where we've have, you know, a spike. Um, we're sort of trying to ride it out, I guess, we're trying to make sure that we flatten it in some way, shape or form by not going outside. But then, you know, schools have opened. You're allowed to go inside and sit indoors at bars and pubs. Restaurants are open, essentially, as long as they're abide by the social distancing and all that good stuff. But it's very difficult to tell people to kind of stop socializing when all the places that they can socialize are open. It's very, very interesting. But hey, <clears throat> like I said previously in another show, this has been a good um, wake up call for myself to, you know, to number one, not care about politics, right? Because I don't. But then also to care, right? It's like a weird double-edged sword. I'm sort of sitting here thinking, hey, I shouldn't be paying attention to this stuff because what can I actually change? I can't do nothing, right? My little position. But there is a responsibility for me as a, as a global citizen or a citizen of the UK to be informed about what's happening, right? To be informed about the developments and to just keep my eye on the prize and just have a bit of a bird's eye view on things, right? And make my own decision or make my own um, opinion based on the information I'm getting, but not be married to any sort of position, right? Because even in the UK, you see these people, mostly conservatives who are like, oh, they don't believe the virus is that big of a deal. Then on the left, then on the left, you have the Labour lot who are like, hey, um, everyone should stay indoors until the end of time, right? So obviously, you know, both ends of the spectrum are batshit crazy. But what I'm not going to do is demonize one or the other. I'm going to take the good um, from whatever camp I can get it from. And then whenever that um, information has been disproven or it's not useful anymore, dash it away and look for some new ones. That's what I'm trying to do. And I hope more people would do that. But, you know, unfortunately, I've come to a realization that politics is a lot like sports for some people, especially people that I kind of grew up with who, you know, I'm not sure you've probably had the same sort of thing, but I've noticed over the last few years, especially with my group of friends, you know, especially male friends, 
most if not all to stop watching live sports they don't really give a crap like i remember when i was younger you'd always have a big group of people you could count on to play football with whether it was in a cage or whether you were missing some numbers on sunday league you could always call up somebody and be like hey can you come and fill in for us can you come and sit on the bench can you come and be the liner can you come and be a goalkeeper i can't even i can't even think of one person i could call right now if i needed a, a couple of bodies for a football game on a saturday i can't think of them even during covid when no one's got nothing to do you know during covid you can't covid is one of those worst times for people who don't like to make plans with friends right you can't really escape your friends during covid because you've essentially got nothing to do but um yeah i don't really know many you know of my male friends who are into sports anymore and i do get the feeling a lot of them have sort of replaced sports with social justice issues or politics in general um they've kind of married themselves to a cause an ideology and they're really pursuing it with the same sort of fervent determination and they take it incredibly personally the same way i will take my united losing right i'd refer it to we lost i'd refer it to i'd refer it as like i was part of that club right the club was kind of running through my veins which obviously it is if you cut me open i bleed red right um you know that's a that's a little bar there you can take that as you please <laughs> but I think for most people, especially people in my age group, they've just, you know, they've kind of committed themselves to other things and politics might be one of them. So it gets a bit weird, isn't it? When you start to see your friends bickering online about stuff that, you know, they can never change from their little, you know, studio apartment in the middle of Bethnal Green. No one's listening to you. No one cares. And if anything, you're probably creating more trouble than you are good. But in general, I think it's a good thing because they're engaged. Um, because if I'm not being engaged, someone has to take that mantle in it. So, um, yeah, that's been what I've kind of noticed during the time that I've kind of observed people during COVID. It's been an interesting, interesting development. But again, you know, we're going to have to pull up with each other a lot more. Um, I think globally, everyone's sort of, um, no one's really out of the doldrums, have they, right? New Zealand's had a bit of a second wave and they've had to kind of lock down as well. Um, I think the only places that I think are doing pretty well has been like, what, I'm assuming Ukraine and Russia because I've seen people play out there. Any place that you see a DJ is where essentially society is returned back to normal, right? Parts of Italy, especially rural parts in like or countryside bits in the south um, near the coast, right? They've, you know, they've essentially been like, hey, let's open up because, you know, they have that adage that, hey, UV light kills the virus if you do it as close to the sea as possible you get all that sea breeze nonsense you remember all those absolute muppets that were going to the seaside to try and breathe in all the fresh air so they can get rid of covid it's not seeming that it's not it doesn't seem like a bad idea anymore does it <laughs> i think they're onto something i think that actually does help like it, it, it's like um it's like crystals and stuff right when i was younger i used to always like scoff at it and make kind of weird comments but then the older you get and the more you start to develop weird little nooks and pain points and tightnesses in the joints, then you start to be like, you know what? Some of this homeopathic um, stuff and some of this woo-woo stuff actually has some kind of benefit, especially when you don't want anything invasive, you know? You know, if you've, if you've ever been to the doctors or the GP here in the UK, you'll know they love, they love prescribing a bit of aspirin or paracetamol to cure all things, right? Um, so I can only imagine how long it takes you to get to a, a physio in this country. I, I've never done it. I've usually just gone private and paid for it because, you know, the back and forth of having to go to a GP and convince them that you need to go to a physio is just insane. But if you want to kind of cut the corners, get involved in woo-woo stuff. Go on Google. Or I'm, I'm assuming YouTube, you probably to find there's probably a lot of um, woo-woo influencers who uh, provide alternative medicines to treat certain things. I know that's what Big Sean mentioned didn't it? in his new album, actually, that he had some sort of heart um, irregularity. He had some sort of palpitation or something, right? That was He had an irregular heartbeat or something when he was younger. And um, instead of going under, uh, under the knife, his mum decided to prescribe him um, a course of magnesium or something and in his uh, from his account it cured whatever he had so it does work for some people it might be a placebo whatever it is i know it does have some sort of benefit and i'm just saying you know maybe those um i won't say they're covid deniers but covid skeptics in terms of why we're waiting for a vaccine they were right as to maybe go to the seaside and get the fresh sea breeze or because i know a lot of people in the uk even did the same thing i read some story about some guys in america renting out an apartment from airbnb in the middle of like bali or something right to kind of escape covid and they're all sort of working remotely that would obviously turn into some sort of like what's that movie where all the kids get is it lost boys where the kids get stranded on the island they kind of get um they kind of get stranded on their their boat basically 
um, yeah, they get stranded on an island, right? They're on a boat and if someone gets stranded on an island and they have to kind of uh, form a society between them, right? They have to sort of kind of work it out, even though they're teenagers or kids at that point. I would imagine that would be the same thing if you decided to rent an apartment with your friends in Bali. It wouldn't go down well. It wouldn't end well, I would say. <laughs> it would probably end really badly, very, very quickly for everybody involved. <laughs> Just imagine. It's already worse enough as it is when you've got a certain group, certain people in your friend group are like, you know, you wouldn't even want to take them to the cinemas, right? You wouldn't want to take them to Carnival. You wouldn't want to take them to, I don't know, Manchester. And then suddenly now you're taking them to Bali during a lockdown and you have to kind of commit to being with them or in their presence for like a year plus. That's a tight one. That's, a, that's, that's one that definitely requires a, a deep vetting process to decide who you're going to take with you. Because I can imagine that might be a thing, though, actually, you know, the second round. Once everything settles down and people can go back, I think the the guys and girls who missed out on having a cheeky trip, because that, that's that's also a smart thing. Remember everyone that was getting pillared online? Oh, you shouldn't go on holiday. You should stay home, stay in place. Now they're looking smart because they all sneaked off and ran off to Greece and went to Ibiza and got a bit of a tan, relaxed, right? Um, You know, had some had some, you know, oysters on the beach and shit you know, a nice cocktail, had some Prosecco. Now they're coming back and they're feeling blessed because you've had your bit of sun, you know, you've, especially if you have the means, you've been able to kind of pop out and come back in. But I'd imagine now when things reopen again the second time, what we're going to see is um, a lot of people taking advantage of that and being like, you know what, I'm not coming back until things settle down for good, you know. That's it, they're just kind of going to fly off to somewhere where things are reopened. Because I think, where is in the UK? It might be Guernsey or something. There's a couple of places in the UK where things have sort of gone back to normal because, you know, especially from Guernsey, you're kind of on your own island anyway and you're away from enough people that you can kind of minimise the threat and I think they maybe had only five or four cases or something. That can obviously help in that regard. But hey, here we are, in it? What can one do? We just have to wait, sit and just kind of bunker down and see what sort of happens from there. But I'm sure people's breaking points is going to come sooner rather than later. People are going to be like, you know what? I've had it. I've had it enough, enough. Let's get out of there. And I'd imagine it's going to happen sooner rather than later for some. Anyway, let's jump into some topics. Um, first one that I thought was quite interesting was obviously um, England ended up drawing 0 0 against Denmark, a pretty lackluster result considering the amount of talent that we have in our squad and considering the amount of good vibes people have towards the team and just in general, right? Um, and then, of course, the other problem with England that persists regardless of what manager we have is selection processes, right? Selections, yeah, the team selections. We have this continuing issue where regardless of how many talented players we have, we, do, we can't seem to put together an actual team that can function um, and play a certain type of football to get the result that's needed to progress to whatever next round or whatever, maybe next knockout stages of a competition. And international football is different from Premier League or regular football because, you know, it's international football. You don't play it as often as you do the Premier League. Um, the managers don't get that, that, that uh, they don't get enough, they don't get a lot of time to spend with the players. Clubs go out of their way to sometimes pull out their star players from playing international football. Most club managers or club chairmen or club fans don't give a toss about international international football unless you're like from a very patriotic country like i don't know mexico brazil uh france maybe spain there's not a lot of countries that actually care about international football so it's always a bit of an afterthought but of course you know england has a lot of hanging has a rich football legacy right if you believe the colonial history of the uk you believe that we actually invented football but you know that's probably up for debate but regardless we're not that good at it even if we def we, we um, invented it but there seems to be a problem with the selection and the selection issue is that usually in days gone by, they just pick the best players from the Premier League. So they'd go down the entire Premier League, extract all the best players that happen to be English and just chuck them into a squad, right? See, it makes up a 23, 26 man squad. But of course, over the years, we've realized that solution doesn't work because, you know, football's all about partnerships. Football's all about systems. Um, and then it's all about sprinkling a system with your special players, right? Um, the reason why Messi worked back in the day with Barcelona wasn't because he was just you know, he was sensational, of course, when he was younger. It was that like he had these other special players next to him, right? The Zavis, the Iniestas, the David Villas, the Sergio Busquets, the Carlos Puyos, that were able to sort of assist him, and even Ronaldinho to a lesser extent, that were able to provide him with a platform to showcase his skills. So you need, you know, you can't just rely on having the best players. 
you need to have sprinkling or some other qu bits of quality there too. So in England, we always go for the best players and this current squad, unfortunately, um, some controversy sprung up with the omission of Jack Grealish, right? Jack Grealish wasn't included in the squad originally. Then after a couple um, dropouts, he was reluctantly included in the squad and no one could understand why. Because Jack Grealish plays for Aston Villa in the Premier League, one of the worst sides in the Premier League last season. A side that sort of doesn't create that many chances, but if they do, they will come through Jack Grealish. He has proved over an entire season that he is a standout player that's able to perform at a high level against some of the best teams in the league. And I think if we hadn't have bought Danny, um, Donny van der Beek from Ajax, I'm pretty sure United would have probably signed Jack Grealish. So, and I'm sure too, his next move after Aston Villa is going to be a big one. But in general, people widely accept that he's a great player. He, you know, great chances created. Seems to be a player who kind of thrives the bigger the occasion. He sort of loves to kind of showcase his skills and kind of has the right temperament about him to sort of like take that Gaza risk, um, Paul Gascoigne mantle, right? He's got that kind of vibe about him. But for some reason, Southgate just doesn't like the guy. And it reminded me a lot of my years playing Sunday League football, where unfortunately, if you just end up in the wrong team during a wrong time with a manager, just doesn't like the cut of your jib. It's all similar when you are at work, right? You just might bump into somebody at work who you just, for, for no apparent reason, you just don't get on. It happens so often. The funny thing is, the more, the more actually hilarious thing is when you end up being pals with people at work. And then you say something off color that you think is a joke, but you know, especially when time has passed and people don't really keep in contact too much, they might lose your sense of humor or your timing and how you joke about stuff. And then you drop a joke and it doesn't land the way it does. And then the person ends up blocking you on Instagram. <laughs> which may or may not happen to me right <laughs> absolutely hilarious like and then you you forget like, hold on why have i been blocked by this person You're like oh yeah and then you remember what the last comment you left on there on their pictures you're like okay there you go anyway shit happens in it what can you do um but you know some people are just not gonna like you it is what it is so it's interesting to see that happening in real time and this is an interesting example of it. Um, this is a clip where Southgate, the English manager, the England manager, sorry, is asked about Jack Grealish. And um, instead of basically giving some run in the mill cookie cut, a cookie cutter, um, you know, answer about it, about how he performed and just maybe, you know, deflecting or just, you know, a standard response would be like, hey, he played pretty well, but it's a team game. I think the whole team performed really well. And we're just trying to make sure that we have a platform to provide players like Jack and other players a platform to perform. I don't know, whatever, right? Probably just, you probably don't need that many words. But this is what he says instead, right? When someone asks him a direct question about Jack Grealish. Let's play it. Obviously, there's been a lot of attention on Jack Grealish, of course. What did you make of his debut? Well, firstly, I thought Connor Cody's debut was absolutely outstanding. <laughs> um, he organised the game. He organised his teammates. His use of the ball was excellent. Um, I thought Calvin Phillips' his debut um, was one he can be proud of. He, he got more and more comfortable as the game wore on. Um, like, what is the need of that, right? You ask, you ask the question about um, uh, Jack Grealish, and instead of answering the question about Jack Grealish, you then go on to describe how Conor Cody and Calvin Phillips played. Who, you know, two great players, you know, especially in Conor Cody's case, right? He was let go from or sold from Liverpool, went to Wolves and essentially rebuilt his career, and now he's got a second chance to play for England again. Of course, maybe he's only there because Harry Maguire probably isn't there. Regardless of, his, of, the, of the reason, he's got a chance to play great. Also, Calvin Phillips, the same thing, right? Last year, he's playing in the Championship. He hasn't even played a Premier League game yet, and he's already in the England squad. Amazing. But it's just, you know... It, there is nothing you can do if you're the player in this regard, right? You've done nothing to annoy this this manager and it's just maybe a stylistic thing. Maybe he just doesn't like the way he plays. He doesn't think he has an actual part of playing his England teams going forward. But whatever it is, it's just one of those unfortunate things that happens in football and sports where sometimes through no fault of your own, there's literally no... Because I think it made me think, because I was listening to the Joko Winnick po podcast and I was also kind of thinking about rereading Extreme Ownership by Joko Winnick. I recommend you check it out. One of my favorite books. Definitely was a game changer in a way I sort of approach work and life, right? The premise behind it is essentially taking ownerships of your mistakes or taking ownership of things when they occur in your life, but also making sure that you are not only taking ownership, but you're taking action, right? You're making sure that you're trying to um, ensure that that thing doesn't happen again. That situation doesn't arise because you're going to do everything in your power to sort of work backwards and sort of of, um, figure out what steps led up to the action that you are not pleased with right whether it's i don't know 
breaking up with somebody getting fired from work losing a wallet whatever missing a flight right wherever that thing happened you're taking extreme ownership on the situation and saying hey even though the driver arrived at the bus stop you know let's say 45 minutes late and that cost you getting to the gate to get your flight if you work backwards you'd still realize that there were points that you actually kind of let yourself down and didn't apply yourself in a way that was needed to order to get the best in order to get the best result possible for you and um i was look, thinking about that listening to recent jocko winnick's podcast especially the one that he did with them this guy called uh jd dylan or something i think his name is jd dylan he was talking to him he's one like another former uh, a former sniper in the navy um or in the still sorry he was basically talking to him about his experience and i was just rethinking about okay if i read a stream of ownership i need to reread it with like a different you know perspective coming into it and then i sort of start thinking to myself hey what where what area in life could you say extreme ownership doesn't apply where legitimately you could honestly hold your hands up and say there's nothing i can do in a situation like nothing you can do to change the person's mind and i guess sports is one of the reasons sports is one of the fields where you could legitimately say hey take the manager out for dinner send them send the manager if they've you know if you if you are if you are able to get the information you send the manager and their partner uh an anniversary gift you talk glowingly about them in public you just do whatever you can to ensure that that person knows that hey you actually like them there's still nothing that you can do to change their opinion of you as an athlete because unfortunately especially when it comes to team sports there are different characteristics that managers look for and i guess maybe if they just don't like the way you carry yourself how you play the game they're just going to be like you know what i can do without it and if they need to pick you just for the sake of having numbers on the pitch they will of course but they're not going to count on you they're not going to depend on you they're not going to rely on you and that's something that can really hurt your ego and i think that's one of the great things about doing sports especially when i was younger i think i think about often about why i'm so like nonchalant and i don't really take things personally ever um and i tend to always try to rationalize or understand the other person's point of view it comes from sports it definitely comes from sports that you know constantly being you know ridiculed embarrassed um lifted up dragged back down again it just does something to you where you kind of you kind of you build up a sense of humility really really quickly especially when you're in a change room or you're in a team where there's people on your team that are clearly better than you and no amount of training is ever going to change that you, you you then decide okay cool here's my i'm going to play my position to allow this person to flourish you know there's no there's no sort of like debate in sports that's the great thing about sports it's so black and white there's either you're good or you're not and if you're not there's only so far you can get right it's only so high you can basically climb and then after that you have a ceiling and then from there you see somebody else that's better than you and it's just it's, it's just an it's an awesome thing honestly i really it's one of the things i recommend a lot it's hard it's harder now with kids because of course you know they're mostly stuck on indoors on games on their phones but back in the day when we used to just play football from like nine to nine every weekend it was honestly one of the best times you get to play you know with some random man comes down in the cage and challenges you guys to a game and you end up getting involved in some sort of physical fracas just because the heat of the game is getting too much and it builds a lot of character man it really does <clears throat> even going to like hostel ends you go and you go on a trip you take the train somewhere to go play some you know some other team in some other area and you know everyone's kind of giving you the evil eye and shit that's always that's always a good time man. i absolutely love it man i absolutely love it but yeah it's sad to see it jack really isn't going to get an opportunity with gary southgate it seems like he just doesn't like the man and then next um we also have um should I? Let's, let's move on for that one jack Grealish. there where's that one with the woman complaining or trying to order some food yeah here we go so um, of course you know i love my public freakouts this is another classic public freakout um again no need to really try and rationalize or try and psychoanalyze this person but it always intrigues me why how somebody can get so bent up um when they're ordering food especially at drive through drive throughs i feel like should be the most stress stress they should be the most um what they should be the least stressful place that you can go and order something to eat I'd imagine number one would be buffets, especially in a foreign country, right? Going to a buffet in a foreign country must be the height of stress. Going to like a food market in a foreign country must be, you know, the anxiety there must be off the chains, right? Trying to decide what you want. Everything kind of, especially if you, when we went to like Mexico and stuff, like everything's jumping up, up at you. The colors, the smells, the noise. Like, you don't know what to pick. You just go crazy. 
um, and of course, busy restaurants and stuff. But I'd imagine a drive through would be really low on the, on the list in terms of causing anxiety or stress. It wouldn't necessarily elicit those kind of emotions, would it? Think about it. You'd rock up, you know, you already kind of know what you want when you're driving, right? A little rumble of the belly tells you, hey, time to go pick up some munch. You rock up, you just think, hmm, what should I get? You know what the menu is, you order what you want, you make your adjustments, don't put sauce, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, you pay your money and you keep it moving, isn't it? It should be pretty easy. You collect it and you go. But this young lady thought um, different. And maybe it's just a mental health thing as well, because she does sound a little bit, you know, that like she might be off a couple of her meds. But God damn, it went from zero to 1,000 very, very quickly. Um, can I get two uh, fro Fox cake pops and a water, please? Okay. Uh, I have birthday, I have chocolate, and I have A chocolate and a birthday. All right, one birthday, one chocolate, and what else was it? A water. And you can really tell she's being an absolute bitch in it, just from just the the the, the, the answers back in it. And that's the poor. That's one of the key indicators of absolute dickheads right if you're going to treat a service person with that level of disrespect that level of content that level of just attitude i know you're an awful person i don't need to even find out more about you i just gotta rock up to the drive through see how you engage with the person that you can hear through the microphone through the speaker and then i can judge your character pretty quickly all right can i get you anything else today no thank you perfect i will see you at the window with your total please don't forget to wear the okay. not wearing a mask here comes the issues. <laughs> I don't. I have a medical exemption. Uh, and as soon as she says she doesn't have a face mask, the, the, the barista didn't even waste time. She just turned around immediately and went to go get a manager. Because guess what? She's been subjected to psychopaths rocking up and using... Imagine imagine going to a Starbucks in order to go and protest. Imagine that's your platform. Imagine that's your field. Um, that's your football field. That's where you go and show out. Imagine picking beef with that. that that's, it's such a bizarre way to make a statement. But engage. Maybe much like there's different segments of social media that exist that we don't really know of, right? Especially if, you know, for instance, Black Twitter. There is a segment of Twitter where if you follow the certain accounts, you get a completely different feed. And if you follow other accounts, it's this whole little ecosystem. There might be a thing as well on Facebook where there's a group of people, pages, where they essentially cheer each other on with this sort of stuff. And the same way that I'm ridiculing the lady recording, they're usually ridiculing the barista or the service person, you know, on the other side of the camera. I'm sure that must happen. But I just can't understand how you can watch this video and side with the woman who rocks up with a bit of paper that says she can't wear a mask because what she can't breathe through her mouth or ears she has a like or no sorry like what are you doing wow they just shut the doors they won't even serve me no, they shut the doors because they're gonna go. She's gonna go get someone from senior management. So to be safe, they close the door. They close the windows. It's not because you are somehow making them quiver in their boots. They just don't want you to cause a stink. So she goes straight to the manager and says, "Hey, deal with this. I don't get paid enough to this nonsense." None of them do. None of them get paid enough to be subjected to this sort of stuff, right? They're already doing you a favor by working right during these hard times because they have no other option and because you know capitalism and all that malarkey. So imagine going there and giving them extra stress. Imagine doing that. Imagine not being the kind of decent human being that would go and have a smile on your face like, hey, how are you doing? You know, really make their lives as easy and simple as they can, as it can be. And then if you know what an actual decent human being does, he tips them really well because he doesn't really, he doesn't really go out. He or she doesn't go out too often anyway. So if they do go to a Starbucks, they've just thrown a little tip because as a thank you to a person that's working behind the till, because you know what? They wouldn't want to do that. So it's like, you know what? Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for sacrificing yourself for my little mocha choca, pano chocolate, toasty cheese thingy that I'm getting from um, Starbucks I could easily make at home, right? Thank you. And you throw them a tip. You don't go there with your bloody handwritten doctor's note. Mom, eh, Starbucks employee, I can't wear a mask because I'm a baby. It's like... I am. You're live. 
because I'm sick of being discriminated against and I don't have a mask. I mask discrimination. You gotta love that. I have a mask. This is what Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, and various other freedom fighters died for, right? Not someone that is probably in his grave clapping along, going, "Well done." This is why. This is what I committed. This is my life's work, culmination. In a, a medical exemption, shit. I have a mask and a medical exemption. Jesus Christ. That's that. That's a bit of a mind fuck, isn't it? She has a mask. She doesn't want to wear it, and also has a medical exemption. Hmm. Someone's not committing to their side. She gets out of her car now. I don't know why she's out of her car. On me. And it's not a door; it's a window. She's banging on the I window now. Name. Imagine making this much of a scene for a fucking panini. I want your names. I'm suing this whole store. Of course, you guys classic. are gonna be sued. I'm suing you. I want your names. Do, do you reckon there's a law firm that exists that kind of has to just that exists solely for the purpose of trying to entertain these psychopaths in their lawsuits? Do you reckon? Or oh, there's a, a law firm that specializes in public freakouts? And I wonder if they actually get. I wonder they, if they actually do get any money from it. I, I probably think they. I, I imagine they do, especially if you just if you've just threatened a, a corporate a corporation with a lawsuit especially now during these sensitive times and you cite um discrimination and abuse or violation of you know some law right stunting along the other you probably could get them to settle out of court and give you in a, and sort of kind of slip you a bit of money in your, in your back pocket you probably could i'm sure regina who else is on staff right now jesus christ regina this is discrimination Have you, are you aware of california 51a set <laughs> Regina's looking at her like, what are you talking about? I have, I have, I have a family at home. Do you think I want to be here talking to you? Discrimination? She's like, okay. Section codes 51A, it says you, we have the right to, to, eat, to shop anywhere we want, regardless of age, sexual orientation, race, or medical condition. And businesses also have the right to refuse entry based on whatever criteria they have. Works both ways, my dear. You really don't. See? You're 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 abusing the law, and I will sue you. You know what? Lennon lost his job. I'm Amber, and you know what? You guys are gonna get sued. I didn't think I was gonna sue you, but now I'm suing you. Yeah, you know what? I got. That's mental illness, isn't it? That's Adderall. That's speed. Um, whatever else they take over there, that's definitely a mental illness. Isn't Five thousand dollars donated to me. I did to sue this to Matt, and you know what? I said I wasn't gonna sue you guys, but you guys are next. <laughs> Starting with this store, laughing at me. Look at them. Laughing at somebody with a disability. <laughs> have fun getting fired and shut down. Yeah, you guys have a great day. I love, I love service industry workers. I love it because I've been in that position myself. Of course, not in the same way, but I love the just the nunch. The same way sports and football build character. Working in, in on the till, working in some sort of window, kiosk, hole in the wall, serving people at a football game, whatever it may be. Being of service to others definitely exposes you to some of the trash humans that are out there. And you find a way of just dealing with them in the most nonchalant way possible. You don't react. You don't get angry. You don't shout or scream. You just nod away. You kind of send them on their way with your little kind of, you know, with your uh, training manual um training manual greetings hello sir how can i help you hello madam are you looking for anything in particular today <laughs> you know <laughs> they start screaming at you like have a good day and they're saying fuck you you're like oh that's the, oh that's unfortunate to hear if there's anything else i can do to help please make sure you give me a call you know <laughs> it's like wow 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 you gotta love it absolutely gotta love it um then <laughs> I thought this tweet from this young lady was pretty funny and very accurate as to what's going on in the UK at the moment. She says, with lockdown too trending and young people getting blamed, may I remind you this, right? The government encourages people to go back to work, children to go back to school, people to eat out and go on holiday and shop. And it's always was inevitable that cases would rise again. As a side note, this isn't me saying schools should close. Blah, blah, blah. But yeah, that's the main one. That is the tweet there. You know that people do that thing where they're like, that is the tweet. Or they do that clap thing. Duh. This is one of them. Look at that. That's so accurate, isn't it? And no one can call them up on it, right? There's nothing really you can say. You can kind of, you can, you can obviously ask them the question. You can ask Boris, hey, Gun, 
didn't you tell everybody to go out and you know and try you didn't you encourage people to save their summer um to go out to countries where uh, they didn't need to quarantine didn't you pilot the scheme called help out you know yeah help out that of course was great for the restaurants but also gave us the false impression that we were somehow doing a good job right and now suddenly we need to scale back the socializing just just imagine what's going to happen during halloween that's what i want to know do, do do people have any idea what's gonna happen during halloween do people have any idea what's actually gonna happen like it's gonna be chaos absolute chaos it will it'll be chaos during halloween because halloween is a lot like um um it's a lot like new year's eve it's one of those weird holidays where people that don't necessarily go out will go out right um I've noticed that especially when I go in when I DJ is like as you as most of the entry level DJs like myself would know, people that are playing pubs and bars, you'd know the horror the 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 gig to never take is anything on a public holiday, anything especially on Halloween or New Year's Eve. Those are the hell gigs, right? They usually pay a lot, but they're not worth the tassel. You get terrible clients. I mean terrible clients some for the most part, horrible punters, right? The kind of person that you rock up at seven and they're requesting you to play bloody uh enter shikari or some shit right at 7 p.m you're like what what are you talking about my friend or metallic right like 9 p.m right at some sort of garden barbecue party thing you're like dude this isn't the setting for that kind of thing like relax um it's just a complete shit show so i can i can only imagine what they're gonna do when halloween comes around i really am curious to see how they sort of handle that issue but hey that is not my concern then on the list next is this i think i mentioned i mentioned previously i might i'm not too sure if i did if i'm repeating stories but interesting do you call it interesting yeah it's an interesting video um clip from no what the thoughts next door a show on no jumper that adam 22 saw sort of pushing where he's provided a platform for selena powell a known skis bag in hip-hop and a couple of her friends who are also known to be a little bit loose and they essentially sit down and air out everyone's dirty laundry, right? That's essentially the premise of the show. If you are a young athlete rapper who has some kind of pigment in their skin, you will have somehow been subjected to these young ladies' sexual advances. Not, not obviously the third lady. I think she happens to be Chief Keith's baby mother called Slim Danger, which is a very appropriate name for somebody that will be carrying or has looked after or is the mother of Chief Keith's um, child. I'd assume they'd be called that. But um, yeah, it's an interesting one because I was just thinking about like, especially being a fan of No Jumper and watching, you know, hit grow and also watching Adam sort of evolve the show, evolve the channel, evolve the store and whatever he's doing outside of it. It's interesting to see him kind of pivot in this direction, really sort of leaning, of course, out of, out of, outside the show, he's sort of leaning in really hardcore into the porn right he's continuing to film scenes with his um illustrious um sex worker girlfriend i'm not sure if they're engaged not too sure but they've, they've sort of like carving their own lane um Lena the plug is smashing it on only fans from what i've hear she's doing very well i haven't checked it i don't know anything about it but from what i hear the grapevine she's doing very very well and he's sort of leaning into it, isn't it he sort of decided hey this is my thing but then he's also decided to provide he's also decided to turn no jumper channel into an anti-69 channel and also a platform to denigrate um some prominent black athletes and rappers who i think are probably beyond reproach i think there's people that you don't necessarily for instance him this no he didn't decide did did selena power i'm not too sure if that was a thing i'm not too sure if selena power had I'm not sure if she aired out Snoop Dogg before this show, but let's let's imagine my timeline works and seeing the power aired out Snoop Dogg when she was on No Jumper. There's a part of me that thinks seeing the power and the co have some really high high class bodies on them, right? They have some big names, right? Not some play play people. So part of me thinks, hey, it might be risky if you're if you're um, Adam to essentially put yourself in a position. Where you're providing these girls a platform for it because it's it might end up hurting deals that you have coming in the future that you have no idea have any correlation with that sort of thing right that's how the industry basically works you kind of have to play nice to everybody because you never know who might end up being bloody you know the 
program director of a radio station or the a and r manager of whatever red label in it you have to kind of pretend to be that's that's the funny thing about in the entertainment world everyone's sort of pretending to be nice to each other because they're worried that this person might end up being the next you know jay-z or something it's insane um or leo cohen or whatever right but part of me thinks like maybe providing these girls a platform to speak you know very badly or negatively or to expose some secrets that probably don't need to expose about certain individuals in hip-hop or in you know hip-hop culture or in black culture in general in america might be very detrimental to his overall success of the channel and where he ends up going he might just have painted himself into a corner now where he won't have the opportunity to maybe interview some of the people that he wants because of the association that that channel has with these kind of skeezies slag skets whatever they make would they take offense if you called them a skit i wonder if they would like I, I don't think so right i think other people would probably get offended if you refer to them as slags because they'll be like oh there's no different to like men doing that but it's like yeah it's different it is it really is that's the way the world works and unfortunately some people do one thing and it's not one you know for instance that lady that's been accused of blackfishing what's her name um jessica krug right she's no different to you know an ariana grande for instance but you know no one says anything about ariana grande because people love her when people don't actually like you or if you have a disagreeable personality it makes it easier to pick apart what you do and sort of dismiss you in some way shape or form but i don't know man i just look at this sort of stuff and i think like what is the point of this like why would you give these girls a platform to do this sort of thing and of course it's up, it's up to them they can do what they want with their bodies they're free but would you want to be remembered like this is this this is like the weird evolution or the natural evolution of like superhead you remember superhead from back in the day right she read that tell all book and do you remember how big of a deal superhead was when she read that book that was a big deal man like she revealed you know intimate details i think about little wayne or somebody is like god damn it you never knew these sort of things and now you hear this stuff about oh the beckham supposedly and it doesn't even it, it it was in a new cycle for what a day at best and it just kind of got forgotten about which is maybe a good thing it, oh it's definitely a good thing if you're if you're obj but i'm not too sure if this is the best tactic for adam 22 going forward that's just basically my opinion on it and again i have no need to play it i don't really care if you want to find it go find it yourself and if you want to find out why what your favorite american football players into in a bedroom i don't really want to know that i never do it's always annoying when you stumble upon a story or an expose on somebody on social because it happens to pop into your feed via the algorithms and you end up finding out a bit of information about people that you don't need to find out right it's like why do i know this you know um, this is another one of those kind of examples. So, yeah, let's move on. Fires. Fires in the Bay Area, it seems like, right? The sky is red. I'm sure some of you have seen it in your feed. Loads of pictures of people posting images of downtown San Francisco where essentially the entire skyline looks like a scene out of um, Blade 2049, right? Madness. And here's an article about it from 7 News. It says, here's why the sky looks so orange, even though the Bay Area air quality isn't terrible. It says, the sky over the Bay Area the area looked apocalyptic once again Wednesday morning, even though the air quality of San Francisco, the peninsula South Bay, is much, uh, it was relatively good. On Tuesday, we had the wind to blame for those smoky skies. The lack of smoky smell, the smoke was coming in from the August complex fire near Montecito National Forest, but high winds were keeping the smoke at a high altitude instead of settling near the surface. On Wednesday morning, the wind shifted now bringing the ash from the rapidly growing bear fire near chico down over the bay area but at the same time there's a marine layer that's protecting us explains abc news meteorologist mike nico the marine layer is stable he says um, area of air that does not rise so we're continually pumping in the cleanser air and so clean the air from the sea that's why the sky is so dark with a yellow or orange hue, but you may not smell smoke when you step outside. Like how gnarly must that be stepping at your house and seeing that? Just imagine. Yeah, you were, you're already living in lockdown, right? As it is, the States hasn't done a good job with Corona, right? So you're kind of thinking, when am I ever going to get back to normal? When am I going to get back to work, right? When can I go see my friends? When can I go hang out with my family? And then you open your window like in the morning with your with your mug of coffee, you're like, Ugh, right? You, 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 you try and say happy you try and say good morning to the universe and you look out and you just see that like that must be so scary legitimately like look at that that is insane legit insane isn't it legit like, look at this the skyline is just red 
red red red that is mad and the funny thing is that this has all been caused by somebody what doing a gender reveal party right, on the other side of town it's flipping wild absolutely wild look at that and then this is the story regarding it right so it's from the bbc news that says what shook uh, california wildfire's gender reveal party blamed for the fire just imagine how you would feel right you cause this insane skyline where essentially you turned it into again a scene out of blade or you turned it into whatever our filmmakers think um mars the surface of mars looks like oh but we know it. that's what it looks like it, it turns up looking at the red planet and it's all because you'd wanted to do some pyrotechnic reveal of your baby's flipping gender god almighty so it follows says youth officials have blamed a gender reveal party for several wildfires ranging in the united states of california a smoke generating uh, pyrotechnic device at an event sparked the el dorado fire which has now spread over seven thousand acres california is ongoing experiencing it's currently experiencing a record heat wave with los angeles reporting its highest ever temperature so it was basically the perfect conditions for a fire to basically catch right gender reveal party uh, it's lockdown parents are desperate to kind of instill some kind of a joy and happiness in their life especially if they've been hooped locked in their homes and not being able to see people you're thinking hey things are settling down somewhat it's a gender reveal party who cares i'm just with my family and friends it won't matter you know a couple of a couple of sparkers here and there right a little uh, a little weapon of mass destruction on the floor why not and then boom you light up the entire place and you you know you essentially paint the town red in more ways than one god damn it <laughs> it continues says the national weather service described sunday as one of the hottest days since weather records began across south um southern west california last month the death valley national park in california reported a temperature of 130 fahrenheit 130 fahrenheit is insane um the largest place now the largest place known as the creek fire has burned more than 73,000 acres and authorities have said none of this um can be contained they need to call hector bellerin and tell him to plant some more to you know every to score a couple more goals um so they can plant more trees so they can follow this it says um it's either about 6 45 on friday perfect um general reveal time an area of a steep rugged terrain helicopters rescued more than 200 people trapped in the wildfire this is insane do you know how mad this is honestly like i wonder if they can get arrested or charged for reckless abandon or something is that do they have fire rules in, in the states they must right in a state like california you would have something that would punish people who were reckless and didn't put out forest fire or bar or barbecue or something well but i imagine what might happen do you think it might be a thing where they tried to put it out and it just couldn't and they just what did a homer simpson and kind of backed into the bush and disappeared um, National Forest spokesman Dan Tune said he did not know how close the fire was to the campsite, a popular boating and fishing destination. El Dorado Fire, meanwhile, was spread over more than 7,000 acres. The California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, known as a Cal Fire, blamed a smoke generating pyrotechnic device used during a gender reveal party for the start of the blaze. Bloody hell. Gender reveal parties are celebrations announcing over here. We know that. But God almighty, man. Just imagine the scenes there. Look at this. Pure devastation, man. You gotta love it, innit? Damaging the ozone layer, damaging the environment, damaging our health by not believing and taking action on a you know uh on a deadly virus and now we're heading into winter season or flu season. Like yay. Yay yay yay. What can you do? Next on the list, what else we have here? Oh we have a couple of Air Force Ones. We have a reveal of the new Stussy and nike air force ones which are pretty nice remind me of the old nike sportswear stuff that you might have seen back in the day when they used to do these really cool tonal versions but from just an objective point of view because you know i'm probably never going to get these because you know raffles and shit are not my way of getting shoes unfortunately what's your I've, ironically enough the only two pairs of shoes I actually won on the raffle were the off-white jordan ones apart from that oh and uh no vacancy and new balances i have that's about it. everything else has been an absolute dub but hey um ho we digress so um this is just more so of an observation that stussy have smashed it with the nike collabs and i don't think they've missed so far they've all been pretty well done very well executed very uh just tasteful in the way they're done and this is another good example of it i'm not too sure if this is a canvasy sort of material 
I'm not too sure. It does look like a toughened canvas with an embroidered swoosh, which you don't usually see on an Air Force, completely tonal. And then I love the fact that they've got the Stushi logo or tab on the on the tongue. You'll see now a lot more often now with collaborations. Back in the day when I used to collect shoes, most of the collabs used to be just colorway based, or maybe they'd allow them to you know have a different insole maybe go ham on the box but usually the actual shoe itself they weren't really given the opportunity to pull up their logo or whatever it may be on there they probably were able to kind of fuck around with the numbers similar to like you know put some you know generic stuff like numbers and stuff and shapes like you do with the nike id but i like that this time around they've you know nike have sort of freed up the possibilities of collabs and allow people to you know change the the actual tab on it so it just says stussy on there I've made, i'm sure it's got a nike logo on it too but i like the fact that they've been able to put that logo because it's one of the best logos in the industry for in my opinion but yeah they look pretty cool man really 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 nice and i'm sure they're going to be incredibly incredibly popular and again one of my favorite models as well all-time favorite air force one and of course in that nice sort of like sandy color that they're sort of um, known for now with their nike collabs um, just a shame about the trousers, isn't it? All these sneaker pictures are always the worst, isn't it? A guy wearing some great sneakers with a pair of ASOS pants or something. It's like, come on, man. It's cuffed sweatpants, really? Like, really? With like, what, some anime font on the side? Some absolutely ridiculous things, but the shoes themselves look great. Like, even look, look how dirty they are. Like, God damn it, my guy. So, what is that? Is that pony here on the back? Or is that, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's just embroidered, maybe. The swooshes, I'm not sure what was happening with the heel, though. Hmm. But yeah, regardless, I like them. Big fan of those. Um, when they're due to come out here, let's see. Oh, look at the detail here. Look at the back of the heel. That is banging. Is that canvas? Is that hemp? It probably isn't hemp, right? But God, that looks so good. I like it that everyone's kind of has this. Well, it's not everyone, but it kind of reminds me of the Union Jordan with a kind of a discolored midsole. Uh, similar to some vintage shoes, but I'm sure it's just more of a tunnel effect. But that little badge on the behind, on the back of the hill is. Any date on this to come out? Let's see if they've got a date on there. No date. No date. Of course, there's no date. Of course, there's no date. You find out. You find out when they're on StockX, I guess, isn't it? Any idea on the date? No, no idea. So we move on to the next Air Force One that I really like. Is this collaboration with Kif? absolutely gorgeous this reminds you of the heyday of air force ones like a co.jp exclusive or exclusive that you'd actually pick up from um, Foot Locker, especially with the new york logo on the side it reminds me of a, a certain colorway that was similar that i think had a not clear sole it might have had a solid black sole navy sole with the um, nike stamp on the side it might have been a mid as well that i had prior but this is absolutely beautiful so it's an air force one low with a what what would you call that a vinyl plasticky sort of swoosh that kind of fades into white towards the back of the hill you've got an icy clear sole here at the bottom and just beautifully executed like oh easily one of my favorites so far i've seen like that's very well done again oh look at the inside look at the lining is that like pile what is the lining there what did they change the material on the lining that's interesting isn't it that's a bit different there i wonder what material that is is that jersey what is that and the look and then again fixing up on the tongue as well branding on there great stuff wonder what i've, I've, I've wondered i've colored the laces but yeah and then the inside of the swoosh so one side is orange the other inside is blue that is so good you can just imagine what the clothes are going to look like too kiff has been a bit you know they've been a bit hit and miss with the with the shoot with the clothing but i think the capsule collection if they do put together a bit of clothing for this will look stupendous oh i like the fact that the hill logo has the kiff logo that's pretty cool Instead of Nike, it says Kif there, and um, just above the swoosh. Um, and yeah, easily, 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 easy, easy, easy cop, man. I'm not sure how much they'll end up reselling for if they were, because the resale price effect, unfortunately, affects their ability to get them. So if they are, you know, a high resale price, the likelihood you'll be able to get a pair is null and void. But if they're low or like a normal um, retail price, you can usually kind of pick them up um, maybe on the day, you know, maybe on the day, instead of kind of having to wait up by the minute on the second to get them on your phone and shit but that's not usually a thing everyone gets them via um raffles now for the most part but they look so good man due to come out in a fall not really a full shoe in it it does seem like a bit of a summary shoe a bit of a missed opportunity but i assume they probably nike probably pushed back a lot of their activations with some of the brands um to later on down the year in the hopes that people could go to stores and line up in queue and you know so they can get some material and you know content that way but god damn it these are good man God damn it, they're good.
bloody bloody good and again no date so far in it no date on arrival and an official date for the kif has yet to be announced but their arrival this fall is likely cool um and then we move on to what do we move on to here oh we've got this um virgil Abloh put together a car with adidas i guess adidas mercedes adidas. i think of german companies so virgil's the could design a car with mercedes i think it's a, a update of a g-wagon i'm pretty sure there's a video here on YouTube detailing some of the things that went on regarding it. It's the description. It says driving luxury forward and in innovative design project, whatever that word is, Galand, Galand wagon. Yeah. Um, the Mercedes Benz and Virgil collaboration, which is pretty cool to see. Um, so let's see it play out. It's interesting that he did it under his own name and not under the off white monarchy. Maybe it's a, an indication on what he ends up doing in the future in terms of his collaborations. I'm not too sure, but maybe this is just what he does in general. No, it did. Was the IKEA stuff off white or Virgil? I'm not too sure underneath what name, but interesting to see regardless to see what he has to say regarding the car itself. <laughs> everybody to the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart. Oh, My wow. name is Bettina Fetcher and I'm the head of marketing for Mercedes-Benz. Project Geländewagen sees Gordon Wagener, our Mercedes-Benz chief design officer, and Virgil Abloh, chief creative director and founder of Off-White, and Man's artistic director at Louis Vuitton, join forces to reimagine one of our most iconic products. It's a G wagon, and it? it's the kind of the quintessential car for any influence, social media influencer out there. I wonder what it is about a G wagon that captured everyone's imagination online because it's weirdly one of those odd luxury cars that happens to be very practical too. It actually does what it says on the tin, but it just happens to look really amazing. I wonder why that in car in particular captured everyone's imagination. It's not like a maybe all that time, the time that was the time that. Uh, Ford didn't update the Bronco maybe it was a reason or maybe the fact that it's just, I don't know I have no idea maybe it's his hip-hop um, or cultural relevance because it was very popular in the 90s Mercedes I'm thinking of the early 2000s early 2000s probably shifted to a few Japanese cars I remember Lexus is being big here in the UK but the 90s are definitely a Mercedes era maybe sometimes even in the 80s but I wonder why G-Wagons were really popular with those people especially now with the new with the kids online in it like kids I feel like the younger sort of like fashion-y kids that aren't necessarily, you know, hooking up with your gotti. You know, there's a certain group of people who want Lambo trucks and a certain group of people that want G-Wagons. Uh, that's interesting to see. Observe. This collaboration is redefining creative exchange and cultural enrichment in the digital space to inspire you to envision new possibilities. So come join. So what is it? Like a, is it like a Nike ID for like a G-Wagon? That sounds great, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit like, um, I, I, what, are they not making them for sale? Like, it's just, I don't know. Maybe it's like a fully immersive experiencing. Maybe when they kind of planned this already with COVID, with, with, with that having COVID in mind, it was meant to be like a traveling exhibition. Or maybe it's just a weird way to essentially hire loads of talented kids from the scene. Because if anything, Virgil's really talented. At what, what really sets Virgil apart would be his ability to kind of harangue all these talented little munchies, min, uh, his talented little minions, sorry, and tell them, hey, why don't you go and send your CV to Mercedes instead of asking to be my intern for a million times? And uh, maybe that's a thing, but it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't sound like they're selling them. Join us on our journey through the story of Project Gelandenwagen. Gelandenwagen. Oh, that was beautiful. So the G-Class is one of our most fashionable... They keep showing that white one. Does that mean that that's the one he designed? I don't know. Products, it has actually remained more or less unchanged for the last 40 years. Wow. So you can say it's a fashion statement by itself. By the way, more kind of, again, I'm sorry to just keep stopping. If you want to watch it yourself, you know, I'll put the link down below. Don't get angry. But it's interesting to see why there's not more companies that do this. They just kind of make the same. And obviously, Nike is probably a good example. They obviously have a whole host of retros. But in terms of the auto automobile industry, there's definitely a desire, especially with some people out there who want like retro cars or old school cars, right? Or especially kind of really iconic models. I think I can think of like a Mercedes SLS that I've kind of been fantasizing over for ages. 
or like a 90s Volkswagen Golf Mark III, right? There's certain cars that people always kind of will want, like, you know, the OJ Mark Ford Bronco, right? Why don't they just have a division within these big car kind of manufacturers where they just make, remake the same kind of car, same model with kind of updated materials, processes, technology, but just kind of keep that shape, keep that ruggedness, keep that utilitarian look about things and just kind of give it to people. And then, of course, if you want to supplement it with an updated version, you can. But just really, just really kind of, you don't even have to have that many cars in your range that you sort of have that treatment for. It just be like marquee certain, you know, certain sort of cars. Like I, I can think of like a the original Volkswagen Golf, right? Maybe you pick a version that um, looks the the most vintagey the most retro-y and then you make sure that it's also the version that kind of you know doesn't break down as often and also the version you can maybe upgrade with some you know modern bits of technology that would probably go a long way to really um make those cars pop more popular and also a great way to kind of acquire new customers the future is not written but it will be what we make out of it we are designers of the future Hello, my name is Gordon. I joined Mercedes-Benz in 1997. Being in the role of Chief Design Officer, I did... <sighs> that reminds me of product design days, industrial design days. There's nothing better than just sitting, sitting down, sketching concept cars and um, concept bits of... Just drafting stuff, in it? Coming up with different ideas and just sort of letting your pen just or marker just glide across the paper fantasizing about things that would never make it into production right and then eventually you end up being you know a design assistant for some shitty studio they don't really give a toss about and then you end up interning for some crappy streetwear design brand and here you are it's not me right it's another person but i remember those days but this is so beautiful man i love it there's nothing better than going into a um really amazing design studio and seeing some of the stuff that they're just working on for fun it's unfortunate that some of the stuff doesn't get put into production but just seeing what they're sort of working on in their spare time always brings a smile to my face. Developed an aesthetic soul for that luxury company. It's called Sensual Purity. It's the essence of the heart and the brain. It is about the emotion and the intelligence. Oof. Hi, my name is Virgil Abloh. My design career has been equally informed by formal training just as much as life experience. Has Virgil run out of hair dye or something? is looking a bit white there my friend mercedes-benz for me is a brand that embodies emotion i don't look at it simply as a transportation company i made a career of working in collaboration and conversation i think that helps us get to ideas that we otherwise wouldn't develop on our own did you get any of that virgil loves saying bare words without saying anything in it love the guy but god almighty man <laughs> The initial idea was to question, to sort of make this sort of twist on reality and speed to have this car that wow. is luxurious in a deconstructed way. We that looks hard, isn't it? We stripped off all materials. We cleaned up the exterior of every unnecessary parts and we stripped entirely the interior. Ripping wow. everything off. That again creates a canvas for something new. The next luxury will be what we make out of it. Whoa. It's an extraordinary approach in every direction. To me, this is a very progressive step towards the future of luxury. Not gonna lie, looks really cool. Oh, I don't know how they. I don't know what it looks like yet, but that is cool. Project Geländewagen. We turned Ooh. an off-road icon into a race car. That looks insane, doesn't it? Have they lowered it? Added some side skirts. And it's got this weird sort of like shiny-ish finish. It's got the mesh on the window, similar to like a rally car. Like, wow. Bring it down onto the ground, put these racing tires on, put the body claddings on and we put literally another art installation inside the jeep that, oh, the oh, 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 that looks so Project hard one formula one car the seats are racing seats from our dtm cars safety elements put into red i think it's very radical the 
idea of the pain. That looks hard, man. You can't see that. You can't not see this stuff on his feed and not get inspired to do your own thing and print your own little t-shirt and make your own little hats and stuff. Like this is the reason why he's a good example for people, you know, especially the kids coming up. Yeah, he might steal some designs and yeah, you know, he might have put out some uninspired collections here and there. But just as a practitioner, um, you know, as somebody out there doing the work on the front lines or on the sidelines, ranting and raving as I'm doing right now. This guy sets a good example, man. That is insane, isn't it? Like, he designed an absolute G... He had, like, a G-Wagon. Look at the tires as well. It's, uh, I'm assuming the old school sort of, like, Formula One tires, right? With the bright um, Pirelli sort of font, right? He's just flipped it, of course, and put Mercedes-Benz there. Like, shit, that looks great. Hoping it makes it into production. Hoping it's not just a concept thing, because we haven't seen it actually in real life yet. Well, not in real life, but we haven't seen somebody sitting in it and driving it. I'm not too sure if that's a thing. It's unique and so that it runs away from the idea of perfection. The finish is typically like the underlaying it of a car. Do anything I don't like a... Oops. This collaboration is... Do anything... The idea here is to... Do anything I don't like about is the headlights. Uh, but I guess, you know, he's got to do, he's added a bit of branding on there, innit? Race, the human touch. We have created a home-scale replica wow. of the unique artwork that will be auctioned off at Sotheby's online in October 2020. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a scale model. It's going to be auctioned off in Sotheby's, okay? The winner of the model auction will also receive an exclusive access to the co-creators, including a personal introduction to the inspirations behind the artwork and the creative powerhouse's aspirations for it. Lastly, we have created an augmented reality artwork. Ah, oh, but it's not going to be made in production. That's annoying, isn't it? That's the thing as well. Raise expectations. With Elon Musk and Steve Jobs that exist prior, RIP, existed that who's around prior r.i.p we had this expectation that these bits of technology that look like they come from the future could be in our hands in it the iphone um you know the tesla um what they're doing with spacex stuff that elon musk is doing now with Neuralink, right they've, they've given us a an impression they've given us the they've given us um, this idea that these things are obviously possible to get irl and now they've what designed this amazing car it looks bloody sensational and just made what a bit of augmented reality a uh, piece that you can what plop in front of your crappy council estate somewhere it's like what's the point in that i kind of wanted to see it in real life i wanted to see it's actually be made in made in production now it's going to end up in the collection of some you know rich guy or girl and it's just gonna you know be a thing i'm hoping a, a museum picks it up or somebody a culture institute gets it and sort of allows people to sort of sit inside and stuff that would be pretty cool but it's a kind of waste of opportunity. Would like to see them actually. I'm assuming there will be something else, and it won't just be this. I'm sure they're going to do an actual production ready version of this in some way, shape, or form possible. It must be that you can explore in your own surroundings. Wow, it's pretty cool. That looks amazing. I love that. So thank you for being part of this journey with us. Or maybe they just had to do all this like lastminute.com due to COVID. It could be a thing, right? It could just be like they decided to kind of go this route because they've got not they've not got a way to do a kind of in person activation. But you know, regardless, that looks pretty fun and pretty interesting. Anyway, that is Action Thing Show episode number three seven one. It's been an hour. It's been fun. It's been a vibe. It's been chill. If you enjoyed the show and you like what you heard, please make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a buy star review download the show and share it with all your friends and of course if you want to support the show via patreon please do by the link below patreon.com for slash agostino patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o but let us one dollar per month you access to my entire audio library as well as my you know entire as well as this podcast actually in full audio format so make sure you check that out don't delay do it today but until next time my friends peace take care sayonara <laughs>